get started here right now. It's, it's just at seven o'clock. So I'm going to turn it over to Buddy Harrison and, and introduce uh, the program and the speaker tonight. Thank you for joining us here for the Friends of Pinellas Master Naturalist tonight. And once again, if you can leave your microphone and camera off during the presentation and any questions you have, just enter them in the chat and we'll get them um, to Jen at the end so we can answer them that way. So um, I will turn it over to Buddy and we'll get started. Thank you, Brian. Uh, most of you may be hearing some rumblings in the background. I hope our uh, presentation tonight is not interrupted by those uh, welcome sounds of possible rain events all around us. I know you're going to enjoy tonight's program, Manatee Tracks. I have the distinct honor and privilege tonight to introduce our speaker, who I consider to be a really good friend and fellow adventurer, Jen is a manatee tracker. That kind of describes what she does every day. She's really a research assistant at the Clearwater Marine Aquarium. And she is out every day in some way or form, um, evaluating, monitoring, locating manatees. And that doesn't even say half of what she does because not only is she working to do that, keep tabs on the, these wonderful creatures who have been tagged and released, but she also makes the call oftentimes when FWC needs to take a look at an animal and possibly find a facility to take them. So she's doing these evaluations um, daily. She's probably the most knowledgeable authority on manatee behavior and patterns of movement that I know because I have the privilege as well to help on occasion as a volunteer with her tracking efforts. And I'm always amazed at how she can predict exactly where those creatures are gonna be. And I've learned an awful lot. We worked together years ago at Tampa Lowry Park Zoo, now Zoo Tampa. And because Jen sort of took me under her wing and sort of showed me the ropes of working with manatees, uh, I have a continued long lasting appreciation for what she does as well as an appreciation for those creatures that uh, we are, I guess we, we're the stewards, we're supposed to look after them. So, um, Jen and her husband, James, are Florida natives and they're enthusiastic, enthusiastic um, uh, kayaking, hiking, camping um, aficionados. They know the Florida wilderness better than anyone I know. So I'm gonna let Jen share some of her experiences and I am so pleased that she is here with us tonight. So Jen, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, thank you, buddy. That was um, that was a very, very um, nice introduction. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you to everybody for having me tonight. Um, let me know if there's any issues with hearing me or seeing seeing the screen. Um, but what I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight is, is my job, is what I do. And um, I work with, or I work for the Clearwater Marine Aquarium Research Institute, which is a recently uh, newly merged um, aspect of Clearwater Marine Aquarium. Um, and specifically, I am contracted by uh, the Manatee Rehabilitation Partnership to monitor manatees that have been rescued and then released back into the wild if there is a, um, a reason that they think that they could possibly not do well once they are uh, release. So we will get more into that. So first off, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, although Buddy did a really good job. of it. <laughs> um, so who am I? Um, as Buddy said, I am a Florida native. Um, I have uh, was born and raised in the Tampa Bay area. I graduated from the University of South Florida. Um, 
with a bachelor's in English, which might seem like an odd uh, degree to have for what I do, but um, I kind of came into this field very circumspectly. Um, but I will say that my ability to communicate um, has served me well in this in this field. So um, I don't take that for granted at all. Um, I did spend 16 years um, at Zoo Tampa as a senior animal care specialist specializing in Florida native species, specifically at their Manatee Critical Care uh, Rehabilitation Hospital, which is where I gained um, the majority of my experience uh, working with, with manatees. Um, in 2018, I did switch to becoming a field researcher, uh, working more with manatees in the wild um, and trying to work more on that side, which was an area that I had a lot of interest in. So I currently um, am the Manatee Rehabilitation Partnership Manatee Coordinator for Manatee Monitoring. Um, so that is who I am. But why, why is there manatee monitoring? Um, and that is a, a long uh, question that, that involves specific manatees. So what, what we do is we take manatees that have been rescued and then um, that are gonna be released back into the wild. And as I said, if there is a situation where we feel that that manatee may not respond appropriately to being released, we will monitor them with this tag. And as you can see um, in this one photo, that is us attaching the tracking gear. And then um, that is another photo of myself out there actually doing the tracking. This is radio telemetry and GPS as well um, that we use to monitor the animal's movements uh, remotely. And then we use the VHF to actually track them specifically to get visuals on them. So as I was saying, why is it that we do that? Um, and specifically it is for these young orphan manatees that have been rescued um, in their first two years of life. Um, manatees learn everything from their moms. So if they have lost their mom in the first two years of life, they do not learn those crucial elements of manatee behavior, such as where to go to find food, how to find warm water, um, and all of the other in-betweens that, um, to how to appropriately socialize, um, good habitat, um, how to avoid dangers that, that are all learned. Um, none of that is necessarily, um, uh, they're not necessarily born with that, they have to learn it. So um, my main goal is to monitor the behavior of these manatees that are raised in a captive environment. Uh, I need to make sure that they are adapting to the wild behaviors and if they don't, if after a point of time, it seems that they are not thriving in the wild, then it is up to me to report that and, and start to create a plan to get them intervened, to get them help, to get them rescued. Um, another crucial aspect of this is learning what these animals need from us so they can be successful in the wild. Um, so everything we know about manatees today and how they live and thrive and what they do in the wild has been from these tagging programs where manatees have been tagged, their, their movements, their behaviors have been monitored. And that's how we've learned almost everything that we have in the last 50 years since studying this animal. Um, by being able to track them as they learn out in the wild, um, we're able to see what foods do they need to be exposed to, what type of temperature changes um, make them react in the way that they react. Um, so many questions that we have um, are answered by watching what these animals do in the wild. And that also, of course, creates many, many, many more questions that we need to answer um, from them. Um, so I focus my work on the West Coast of Florida. There are two of me, really. Um, I am the West Coast, and then there's another person who does what I do on the East Coast. So I am everywhere from the Panhandle to the Everglades. It really depends on where these animals go um, once they are tagged. So um, what we will do is when an animal is being released that we consider to be naive, we will um, release them on a very cold day in a warm water site, which is very near to where they were initially rescued. Uh, we want to make sure that if there is any geographical imprintation that they have, that, that we are accommodating that by putting them as close to where they mom would have taken them had mom 
um, not been taken out of the picture. So the main spots that those include is the Three Sister Spring area in, in Crystal River, the Manatee Viewing Center at Tico Power Plant in Apollo Beach, uh, the FPL Manatee Park in uh, Fort Myers off the Caloosahatchee River, and then Port of the Islands in uh, the Faka Union Canal in Naples. Um, these are our, our main release sites. And then from there, the animals go to wherever they want. And then it is up to me to, to try to keep up with them in whatever way that is possible, um, whether it be on land, on boat, by kayak, um, however, it, whatever it takes to get to where they're going, then um, that, is, that is what I do. So the tracking gear, um, as I, I showed you a little bit earlier, consists of a, um, a tag here, um, a tether, about a four foot tether, and then this belt that goes around their peduncle. Um, all of this gear is custom made by hand by us um, because it has to be fitted to the animal. Um, when these animals leave captivity, they are in the most robust shape they will ever be in their life. Um, and going back out into the wild, there's a learning curve as to where to eat, how to eat, so they kind of go out in um, top notch shape, which um, so they are going to lose weight as they figure out uh, the feeding feeding uh, patterns in the wild. So we we definitely want these belts to stay rather fitted so that they don't fall off um, in any way. Um, this is a, a vinyl plastic tether that also includes um, the sort of bumpy thing in the middle is a temperature probe and it is constantly taking temperatures um, monitoring that. And this is information that helps us understand um, what the temperature range is for manatees and that affects their movement. Um, the kind of basic talking point is that once manatee, once the basic water temperature hits 68 degrees or lower, manatees need to be in warm water or they can start to suffer from cold stress. We are finding that that is a really very um, not a specific number. Um, it really depends on the animal, their size, their their body condition in the time of winter, their experiences. Um, sometimes they wait till it gets very, very much colder before they decide they wanna go back. So understanding this temperature um, range and how it affects these animals is a, is a new, is a new um, data point that we're looking at to help us understand again, what these animals need in the way of warm water locations. Um, the tag itself is, um, as I said, has GPS and VHF capabilities. Um, all of the brains of it is in this um, thin cylindrical part. This thick white part around the sides is um, a lot of foam um, to protect to, to protect the tag and help it to float. Um, as you can imagine, these things float behind the animals, so they they do take a beating. And so the, the white flotation part helps it to absorb some of that. Now, because um, there is a risk of entanglement, all of these items are built specifically with breakaway weak points. That is so if they get tangled up and get caught on something, the animal itself is not trapped. They can actually break it off and, and free themselves. It, it, however, makes my job a lot harder because then I have to try to go and, and find them again. Um, and the way we can do that is in this belt, which typically will stay on. It does have a weak link. It can break off it, but it's not something that frequently gets in, caught on anything because it usually is so fitted to the animal. But so they do this, this tether and tag can break off, but most of the time the belt will stay on. And in, in this belt, in this location here is a sonic transmitter. And each belt has a specific frequency and a series of sonic beeps that you can hear underwater with a hydrophone if you are within 1500 feet of the animal. So if you know they have a, a, a frequent location that they like to be in and you're trying to relocate them without a tag, um, it is possible to do it that way. And then um, if you are very fortunate and things all work out for you, you can get another tag on them to, to maintain the, the monitoring process. Um, again, the, the tether also has a weak link um, and then there's the, the tag with its flotation device. So this is how it actually looks underwater. Um, you can see that it goes again around the mantis peduncle uh, and floats behind them. Um, it can, it does look rather bulky to most people. They feel like, you know, it seems like it's a lot to add to this animal, but I can tell you that it is, it's almost maybe five pounds total um, for a 600 
pound animal, that's really not that much. And as somebody who has had to swim with these attached to me quite frequently, I can tell you, I don't even feel it. And I've had plenty of them fall off of me and float away. And I didn't even know it till it was too late because I didn't feel it break away. So the tag will give us GPS locations um, every 15 minutes. And this is what that, that looks like. So um, this is an animal and I can uh, pull it up on a computer and see exactly where it's been, what it's been doing, how long it's in a spot. Um, and all of that is, is really critical information that we can see remotely. Uh, the only problem is, is this has basically a, a four hour delay. So I can't necessarily see it in real time, but it, it is um, helpful to see where they have been um, and this helps us know if, if they're sitting in one place too long, that can obviously be a problem. Um, but sometimes they do that and you go out there, you think you're going to find a problem and they just found something really good to eat. So um, that's, a, that's an, another interesting point that you can learn from, from what we're doing with this. So the tag, as I said, um, takes a beating. Um, and these are just some of the the remains. Um, this is a tag on the, the left here, and you can see it's been sheared on one side uh, from a boat. Um, and this tag actually still maintained its function. It still worked because it didn't quite get to the, the nitty gritty inside. Uh, the flotation collar worked. But after a while, once the outer rim has been breached, the, the foam will start to take on water and it be becomes rather heavy. So we had to change it out. Uh, this is the belt that goes around the manatee's uh, peduncle, as I said, and this is one of those rare occasions when the belt did come off. Um, now, typically, we will see them break here around the yellow uh, buckle part if they get entangled. However, this one was sliced very cleanly on the side, um, which indicates that that was most likely from a boat propeller. And unfortunately, that animal probably was injured in that incidence because it's really close to their body. We were unable to relocate that animal or any signs of an animal with injury. Um, so hopefully maybe it wasn't that severe, but um, still disheartening for to find that. Um, and then on this far right side is um, one of those situations that is sort of, you, you can't blame them, but uh, they sure do drive you crazy is the alligators. They do like the tags. Um, you can see down here at the bottom, a few teeth holes. Um, they did a good job of chewing off the foam. Um, we don't know why alligators like these tags so much. They they don't bother the manatees, but they do go for the tags quite frequently. Um, personally, I think it's because it's just something bebopping through their, their environment that looks like it should either be eaten or defended against. So um, I think that's why they are so popular with our reptilian friends. But um, again, does make my job much, much harder um, to, to do. So, um, and um, again, I am part of the Manatee Rescue and Rehabilitation Partnership. Uh, we do have a website called wildtracks.org where um, a lot of this information is also, and it also um, will, uh, sort of a blog of all our manatees that we're tracking uh, that we update with our field notes and you can see the animals that are being tracked and where they are. Um, again, it is it is delayed. So um, it just sort of has a built in lag in it. So it's not real time, but it can show you where they have been. Um, and then the field notes that get updated that tell you, you know, what we've seen while we were out there. Um, this is also in connection with Clearwater Marine Aquarium um, is also you can go through that way to link to this to all of this information. So that's a, a kind of quick overview of the work that I do. Um, and there's a lot more to manatees and manatee research than I kind of covered in that. But I thought at this point, if um, since there is such a broad subject, it would be more prudent to answer your questions that you have specifically. So um, in that case, I can turn it over to you guys. Okay, Jim, that was great. That uh, is a good picture of what you are con confronted with when working with these creatures. I've got a, a question here from someone in the audience that uh, is asking, what are the tags made out of? 
And who makes the GPS tracking equipment? Do you know who the manufacturer is? Um, I, it is a lot of people. <laughs> every, every component comes from someplace different. Um, we, we do use Telonics as our tracking um, uh, system, um, but the tag itself um, is, uh, we, get the, we get the body of it, um, the GPS mechanics, um, honestly, that is actually a part of it. I have not personally done, so I don't know exactly where that comes from, but, um, it's, it, a lot of pieces come in a big box and then we put them all together. <laughs> um, <laughs> Some assembly so, required. Right, exactly. But, um, I, Telonix is what, um, where, uh, we order a lot of our tracking supplies. Now that's not necessarily the GPS tags that could be from a different area, but, um, but we work with Telonix on our tracking systems. Okay. Um, I know that you covered this um, pretty much, but you have a GPS tracking device. So you're getting real-time location. There is also uh, a VHF radio transmitter that is sending just a chirp signal that you can pick up with your uh, GPS or your VHF receiver and directional antenna. And you also have a sonic uh, transmitter or transducer, whatever, that's built into the actual belt, isn't it? It so is, that, yeah. So if you lose part of the tag, you can still track the animal. Correct. Um, so um, we have, as you said, the GPS which we can see from anywhere in the world that we have Wi-Fi and a computer. Um, we can download the tag information and see where that tag is and has been. Um, that will that basically gets us to our starting point. Um, as I said, it is though it's it is real time. It's not because um, if I looked at it right now, it will it will probably be four hours behind. So. Um, it won't tell me where they are right this minute, but they'll tell me where they were four hours ago. And unless they are in a hot pursuit of something, they're usually in that same general area. So it gives you a starting point to go out. Um, then there is VHF. And um, so we have a VHF antenna and tracking box. Um, we take this out and it has a range of about two miles. So um, the tags frequency and with that we can start to to pinpoint where the specific spot is of that animal and it is radio frequency so it can be a little misleading sometimes because the sound does bounce around if the animal is in say like a residential area with a lot of concrete seawalls um, it can bounce bounce back and forth uh, the tree lines can throw it off um, the tags do not transmit underwater if it's salt water. So if the animal swims down and pulls the tag underwater, then you lose the signal entirely. So if they're sleeping and only coming up every 10 minutes, that can make it a little bit challenging because you're getting one beep every 10 minutes. It can be hard to sort of pinpoint which direction that is. Um, so it takes a little bit of um, guessing, luck, um, and knowledge of, of the animal. As you track them, you start to learn their patterns, their behaviors, the places they like, um, and um, you can start figuring it out on your own to some degree um, where they may be. Sometimes it's just trial and error. Go up one canal, turn around, go up another until you find them. Um, but um, you can start to, to dial in the radio frequency as you get closer to actually pinpoint where that tag is. And then as you mentioned, in the belt, there is a sonic, a sonic frequency that um, with a hydrophone, and again, um, a specific receiver box, you can hear the belt, but you have to be um, in dead reckoning with it. It has to be right in front of you. There can be nothing blocking it. It can't be around the corner. You have to be about 1500 feet um, to, to hear that. So you, you have to have some idea where that animal is um, to even begin to find them that way. And again, that, that also comes into play with knowing their patterns where they like to hang out and then a lot of luck. 
Yeah, it sounds like you've got lots of tools at your disposal, but Mother Nature throws you twisting, winding creeks where you might think that that radio signal or that sonic signal is right in front of you, but there's nothing but mangroves in front of you and the animal may be on the other side. So you're always out there tracking, tracking, tracking. And I would imagine that's where the the animal behavior really becomes important, understanding that. Indeed, yeah. I, um, I tracked for a while in the 10,000 islands, um, and that is not an exaggeration when they call it that. So um, trying to figure out which mangrove island <laughs> the animal is at is, um, is very challenging. And just so you know, if you look down and look back up, all the islands get up and move around and, and change spots. I think those that, of us that have been down there truly believe that you're right about that. They all look alike. They, they all move around. Uh, here's a question that Jay asked. What's the longest time that you followed just one manatee? Um, longest time as in a, 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 a day, specific... A couple of days trying to locate? Oh, um, hours. Um, if I, if I end up not finding the animal in a particular day, it's either because, um, geographically they have left and I'm not geographically in an area to, to get to them. The weather has turned on me or I know where they are. I just can't quite get there because either the water's too shallow, my boat's not right. Um, so I, it, it, it typically will, I have tracked one animal for seven hours before finding it. Um, and that was in the Everglades and it was, it was traveling and most of the time I was just lost. Um, but, um, if I, if I have nothing in outside of, I mean, if, if the weather tides and all that don't interfere, um, it usually doesn't take more than an hour or so to, to, to locate them. Okay. And then, then there are constantly moving targets. So that adds to the fun. Mm -hmm. um, Cheryl asked, do you go out by yourself when you're tracking? I, 90 percent of the time I am alone uh, tracking um, on occasion I have a, a wonderful esteemed volunteer that will assist me um, and but I will say that for the most part um, that is and that is very useful especially there are occasions when I need to to swim for this, these animals and and that is to get an idea of what they look like again as I said my whole goal is to be able to report back to the partnership whether this animal is thriving, is it doing all right? Is it eating? Is it finding uh, warm water? Is it finding good habitat? And um, I spend maybe an hour and a half each week looking at them up to three hours. You can't always discern that from that observation. You don't always catch them when they're eating. You don't always uh, get to see the signs of that physical thrive. So uh, on occasion, it's it's necessary to actually visually see this animal in uh, 360 degrees. Is it got a round belly? Is it, is it too thin? Is it got a new injury that maybe it's sustained that we need to be aware of? So, um, again, the tags break, they come off, they need to be reattached. Um, and the end of the whole thing, the tag needs to be removed. All that is usually done in the water by myself. And it, and it takes having a very competent assistant <laughs> who can watch for alligators, other boats, sharks, um, and then come pick you up after you've been swimming for a very long time and need a ride back to, to, to shore. Um, so, but, but the basic answer is yes, 90% of the time I am by myself. I'm glad you answered it that way because in my introduction or in my, uh, I guess, ad for this program, I mentioned that you do this in all kinds of weather mm -hmm. and in all kinds of conditions. And that truly is something that is um, it, your job sounds like the dream job, but I have to say, I know that it's hard work <laughs> because you are confronted with a lot of unknowns out there. So Dan asked, how many manatees are you currently tracking? And has this changed since maybe uh, the winter time? Um, it has. Uh, currently I'm, I'm tracking three uh today 
um, when we initially released manatees for this season in February, and usually every January, February is when what we call the new class of kids come out of a rehab and they get tagged. Um, I had 10 of animals to track, and that is an excessive number, I will say. Um, five is a lot, uh, because as, as I said, they get an hour and a half visual each week. Initially, when they go out, they get two hour and a half visuals, because we need to really know if how they're doing in those first few months. Once we feel, see them eating and feel like they're doing all right, we can tailor that back. So um, th say three hours for 10 manatees, that's 30 hours um, a week. Um, it, so that's a lot. Um, factor in driving, travel, tracking time, um, it adds up to a lot of time. Um, but the, the amount of animals being really, being rescued that are in need of monitoring keeps going up every year. So um, it's only going to get worse. Now, as I said, I started off in February with 10 um, and now I'm down to three. Um, now that's not all bad news. Um, one of them actually graduated and that's what we say when they have demonstrated manatee skills to the point where we think they are successful um, and we remove the gear. So one of those candidates um, was sort of a repeat customer. Um, she didn't come back to warm water in the winter time, but we were able to relocate her, re-release her, re-monitor her, and she uh, showed us that she knew what she was doing. So she actually graduated. So she came offline. Uh, sadly, two of the animals I was tracking did, did die. Um, two were re, had to go back into rehab because they weren't, weren't thriving. Um, and I'm, my math is probably getting fuzzy because I'm, they all start to blend together, but a couple have lost their tags, um, and one lost his belt. So, um, it, it leads me back down to where I'm at with three. Um, so, um, it was a busy winter, <laughs> um, but, and next winter, uh, is on track based on the animals that have been rescued so far to be equally as, as busy. Okay, I've got another question here um, from Ashley, who says, how did you get into working at Zoo Tampa with a bachelor's in English? <laughs> I'm interested in, in going into the exact field, but we'll, uh, we'll also have a somewhat unrelated degree. Um, well, that was a long time ago, I will say, <laughs> um, almost 20 years. Um, and I, I volunteered. That's what I did. I was, I started as a volunteer at the at the zoo. Um, I just wanted to do something with my life that was give it more meaning. So um, I didn't think at the time I could make um, make it a career um, for the same reason. I didn't think I had the education or experience. Um, I will say in that time period, the zoo was a little um, smaller um, and uh, had different um, requirements for for its animal care staff. Um, that, has, that has somewhat changed um, to where their requirements are a little bit more um, uh, strict. Um, but for nine months, I volunteered there as um, a volunteer. And when the position opened, um, due to, the, to what I had shown them of me, as opposed to what I had on paper, um, I had shown a commitment and dedication and ability to learn what needed to be learned to do the job. And so I was able to, to secure the position. I will say, I don't think that would happen today um, and, um, because the, the requirements and the field of animal care has, has changed dramatically in, and for the best in the sense that it is now um, more specific and science related. Um, and it doesn't mean somebody without a science degree couldn't get in. Um, I think they, they definitely can. Usually it's a, a college degree is necessary, but it doesn't necessarily have to be science if, if it can be shown that there is um, a, a work history. Um, and, and by that, I mean interning, volunteering. Um, those are the best ways to get the jobs you want is to do the job. Um, and people are more happy, more likely to hire somebody they know already what they can do than hire somebody who looks good on paper, but they have no idea what they're capable of. Um, so if you don't have the degree in the field you want to get into that, I don't think that's a closed door. It just means you kind of have to show, show them, don't tell them. Um, and if that means getting in as a volunteer, as an intern and showing what you will do 
um, and how good you can do it, it that goes far to getting you uh, where you want to go without necessarily the, you know, if you want to take a different route than standard, I would say. Yeah, do they still have uh, volunteers working there? Um, they, they're, they do have volunteers. I believe they've, they've shifted to more of an intern program. It's a lot okay. more formal and they formalize a lot of their, their hiring and intern programs, um, trying to, um, just raise, raise the bar. Um, and, and again, it, it is for the best. The field of animal sciences has really come a long way in the last 20 years. Um, and it's a good thing. So, um, it, but it does make it harder to sort of get in if you aren't already you know, have your foot in the door that way as far as studying it. Again, not a, not a done deal. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you have to work a little harder and, um, and just show people what you have as opposed to just being able to sort of put it on a resume and slide it under the door. <laughs> Great answer. Uh, here's a question from Jean. I've always heard that orphaned manatees typically can't be released unless adopted by a rehabbing manatee and then released with her. What are the parameters for considering releasing an orphaned manatee once healthy? Um, well, I will tell you that is not what, what you've said is not actually true. Um, manatees, we, do, we don't uh, release orphan calves with um, any other manatee specifically, um, and they don't typically get adopted um, in a traditional sense. So man manatees themselves are social animals, but they do not have a social structure. So unlike other marine mammals, you know, like a dolphin's pod or, or those kinds of things where they have structure and, and um, a hierarchy, manatees don't have that. You can put any two manatees together and they will always get along. Um, they don't fight over resources. They don't fight over, there, there's just no natural aggression towards their own kind. They're one of the few animals that have that. Um, and it, and as idealistic as that sound, it's actually a survival technique because these animals have to congregate in very small warm water sites during the winter. You've seen the pictures, I'm sure, of hundreds of manatees just like rocks together in these springs. If you don't get along with your neighbor, you're not going to survive. So I think that that ability to socialize like that is a survival technique. So that being said, um, when an orphan calf is rescued and, and rehabilitated, depending on its age when it comes in, it, it sometimes has to be bottle fed. Um, and there's a system for doing that where you are not imprinting on that animal. That's as, it's um, as hands off as it, as it possibly can be. But once that animal is able to be weaned and on solid food, it does go into the general population of other manatees being rehabbed. Um, and as I said, they all do get along, not necessarily adopted per se, but they, they do all tend to get along. Once the manatee, the orphan manatee reaches um, about 600 pounds and, and um, over a certain amount of length, there's, there's a, a definite body size that it needs to be to be considered um, uh, of a healthy nature to be able to go out in this situation. That manatee is then released into a warm water site where there are other manatees congregated. The idea is that they will follow those manatees out to find food, back to warm water, and then typically all the other manatee skills that they need to learn. Um, and we do know, and this has been successful um, time and time again, this, this um, type of release pattern. So they don't need to be released with another rehab manatee and they don't need to be released with a specific adult, but they do need to be released in an area where manatees are congregated um, in a great mass um, because you don't know which one they're gonna you know, buddy up with to follow out and back. And I've, I've seen them, as I said, where I watched them and one day they're with one manatee that has very specific scars. You go back and they're with three others that look completely different. So, um, and then sometimes they do stick together. It's, they're like people, you know, you, everyone's different. Um, but as far as being able to be released, they don't have to be released with, with a, another animal. Um, they can go by themselves. Sometimes if we, as like this year, uh, we had one day we released five at one time, but that's because we had so many that had to go out. Yeah, and when you get that, that uh, slate of five, your 
work effort just increases exponentially, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's a question from Kurt. We have seen a lot of manatee deaths this year. Is there any particular cause or causes of the increase this year? Um, the higher numbers um, are definitely related to what we are calling a um, unusual mortality event on the east coast of Florida. And that is where the bulk of these manatee deaths are occurring. Um, the official, we don't, I will say we don't know 100% why that is happening. There are a lot of ideas. There are a lot of theories. Nothing has been scientifically proven to be the the trigger, you know, the 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 thing. Um, we do know these manatees are coming in starting. They're coming in emaciated. They're coming in thin. They're coming in with varieties of pneumonia and other infections that are um, secondary to the fact that their body has not had enough nutrition. Um, so that is a fact. That is why that is the cause of a lot of these animals that have died. Um, the other fact is that there is a significant decrease in seagrasses in the Indian River Lagoon area where um, most of these East Coast manatees go uh, to find warm water in the winter. Um, so that is a fact. Now, the, the theories about why that has happened in that area, what, what has caused that seagrass to decline are varied and, and some seem just to make common sense, some, but, but nothing has officially been proven. So um, there are a lot of people in this, in this organization, this partnership in this field that are doing a lot of different things to try to figure out the answer to this, to this problem. Um, and, and it can be not one thing. It could be just a perfect storm of many things from hurricanes years ago that stirred up the sediment, um, preventing light from getting to the grasses, from um, an excess of nutrients, uh, pesticides and things that have affected the ecology that have affected the grasses, um, from rising water levels that, again, are preventing sunlight from getting to the, the grasses that, that need to grow. Um, it can be many, many things. Um, so trying to find that one thing that we can just instantly fix is, is not really realistic. So, um, but another factor to that, that is, you know, contributing is that these manatees have learned over generations to use these man-made warm water sites. So the Cape Canaveral Energy Center, the Orlando Utility Company, um, there, there are these places on the East Coast, they're at, similar to Tico, that have these warm water discharges. Over generations, these manatees have learned to go there to find warm water because a lot of the natural warm water sites are off limits to them due to development, pollution, and other things. So yay, they found warm water in a spot not necessarily meant for them, but now that's a problem because there's no food there. So where do they go to get warm and then not starve? So basically these animals are having to choose between going somewhere far to find food and not necessarily being warm or, or staying near the warm water and not having enough food. So um, that is the crux of what is happening to the manatees on the East Coast and why the casualty rate has been so high. Again, it is, it is the lack of food. Why there's a lack of food is still remains to be answered um, sufficiently. Again, a lot of ideas, a lot of theories. It could all be some of it, all of it, none of it. We just don't have those answers yet. They're being looked at, they're being studied, but, um, but the, the, that one answer we need just it hasn't come up yet. Yeah, it seems like there, there is a combination of factors there that's really hard to pin down exactly. Um, I did hear this week where Swift Mud and the Tampa Bay Estuary uh, program released their seagrass survey results and Tampa Bay had lost 13% of their seagrass as a result of the latest survey. Um, so it just underscores that, that uh, importance of seagrass and not only to the the manatees, but to the long lasting health of this bay. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's a, that's a good thing. 
question here from KC, how can we, or what can we do to help our endangered manatees? Um, a lot, actually. Um, they're a very resilient animal and it, it really doesn't take a lot from us to, to make their life a little less stressful. So um, as, as we said, the, the, main, the main threats to the species, um, number one is, is boat strikes. Um, they, they get hit, um, I mean, 99% of manatees have a scar pattern that they can be, that can be used to identify them in a database. Um, that means, I mean, that's, that's how we're identifying them is by their injuries. So that's, that's sad. Um, but, you know, and yeah, those are from prop marks, um, but it is actually the hull of the boat going at a high rate of speed that breaks their ribs, punctures their lungs and, and, and actually causes them death. Um, we, you know, we have speed zones set up, you know, but it's like a speed zone on the highway. <laughs> it can be arbitrary to some people as to how fast they, they choose to, you know, whether they want to, you know, abide by the speed limit. Um, some of those speed zones are also interpretive, um, slow speed. Well, what is slow speed to somebody with, um, you know, an engine that can do 150 miles horsepower versus somebody who has one that does 25? You know, what is, what is slow to you? Um, so in that sense, education is, I think, the key to manatee uh, conservation, because I, I have yet to meet really anybody that hates them, wants them dead, doesn't care, um, you know, who just thinks that we should go out and slaughter them. Like, I, I don't meet those people, and I hope I never do if they're out there. Um, so what's happening to them is lack of understanding, it's lack of education, it's lack of knowing um, how to to thrive with them in their environment. So, you know, educating, having um, a, a straight across the board boat license. Um, if you're certain, at this point, if you are of a certain age, you do need to have a, a boat safety license to drive a boat. But overall, um, you don't really need much to, to get a boat and drive it around Florida. Um, you need a license to drive a car, a motorcycle, and a, 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 a bus. A uh, drone, a plane, a uh, train, but but not a boat. Um, you, you need a credit card and uh, be an adult, and you can pretty much get a boat and, and drive it however, wherever you want, without any understanding of the environment you're using it in. So, um, I think having education in that sense of of a boat license would would help people to understand uh, how to function in their environment. Pollution is also. A, a key part of their impairment when it comes to their food sources, um, regardless of what's happening in, in the Indian River, River Lagoon, pollution is affecting manatees everywhere. Um, it affects their all life um, between fishing line and discarded uh, things that they become entangled in, um, other pollutants that, that destroy their food sources. Um, you know, there's red tide, which they, they feel can be um, exasperated by pollution. So, you know, reducing our, our pollution footprint. Um, and sometimes that that's hard to think about when you're inland, that what you do inland affects our bays, but it all, it all goes there. Um, so, um, and, and then it's development. Um, when we're looking at developing these areas in Florida, making sure we're maintaining um, the places these animals need to survive, that we're not taking away their access to their warm water sites, um, their, their safety zones um, where they can get away from all of those other stressors. So um, it sounds like a lot of big things to do, but in the end, it's really a lot of little things. It's, it's you know, each person being responsible for their footprint on this earth and, and it's education and it's, it's talking about it and, and, um, and, walking that walk so when we're out there is, you know, it's and one thing to tell people, this is what you should do, but it's another thing to do it when you go out there. Um, so, you know, pick up, pick up that can that's floating in the water when you, when you kayak by it, you know, cut that fishing line out of the mangroves when you see it, you might not get it all. You might not get, you know, sometimes it can be overwhelming when you see that stuff, you pick up one and you see 900 others, but if that's even just the one you can get, um, then that's one less that's out there. So it, it's, the little things that add up to big things, big changes. Absolutely. There's nothing like coming back from one of your adventures where we picked up plastic barrels, um, floating 
patio chairs and all the other stuff that somehow gets in the way of tracking manatees. Um, yes, and that, and that barrel became a rain barrel in my garden. So, you know, having a whole new life. <laughs> perfect, perfect. I liked, I liked your answer to uh, referring to conservation of these creatures, uh, conservation of the resources in the bay, because if we do our part, this is my understanding, if we do our part to start protecting those things, taking them not for granted, it's, it's less expensive in the long run to take conservation efforts than it is to later on try to come back and, and uh, mediate somehow with some sort of program to put things back into place. So mm -hmm. anyway, uh, another question here from Jean was, what was one of the most interesting or surprising things that you've come across or learned while tracking manatees? Hmm. Um, Maybe some of the people you've encountered. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that there, there are so many answers to that question. I mean, as far as the animals themselves, I think one of the things that I fascinate me is their ability to use the tides and how they learn to use the tides. Um, and, you know, as I said, I have this GPS. I see what I can see what they they're doing 24 hours a day virtually. Um, when you overlap that with the, the tides and you because sometimes I watch their tags go into these tiny little shallow, muddy creeks. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to go get a helicopter tomorrow to get them out of there because there's that's what are they doing in there? But then they 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 leave, and then you start noticing that they're they're using this tide, the tides, to access f food sources they obviously can't get to when it's low tide, and 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 they're learning that. Like um, you you see them sit sit outside, almost pacing, waiting for the water level to get to the point where they know they can get in to get whatever little snack back there they want, um, and it, it fascinates me that because um, honestly, I I still struggle with tides. I'm like, oh man, I forgot low tide can't get there, but they got it. And they don't even have the apps and the tide charts. They just figure it out. So um, I, I think that's fascinating about, about them and their day-to-day -day activities. Um, some of the, the cool things that have happened with them being tagged, and I like to say it's sort of us learning their secrets or their, their you know, the little secret spies. Um, we've had a couple occasions where, um, for once, uh, we had a gentleman down in Southwest Florida who was a, a very well-known manatee harasser. He would post videos of himself doing things that were definitely illegal and harassing and not, not nice. He thought they were nice. He thought it was great, but it was definitely not okay. Um, but he was also very savvy as far as legalities and how he posted his videos without making it possible to to hold him accountable for what he was doing um, or even knowing where he was doing it at um, and not showing who he was and, and not making it so that legally he could be held accountable for his actions. Um, unfortunately for him, he posted a, one of those videos with a tagged manatee in the video. Um, so uh, law enforcement teamed up with the service and Fish and Wildlife and us by correlating the tag data with the video timestamp, uh, we were able to get his address and um, know where all of these shenanigans were taking place. Um, the law enforcement, there's a, there's a large undercover <laughs> contingent of fish and wildlife law enforcement that I was not aware of, but they're out there. Um, they were able to, in an undercover way, basically catch him red-handed doing what he was doing and he, was able to face the full penalty of the law. So one of our little tag manatees was super spy and uh, caught the bad guy. So I thought that was pretty cool um, for that. Um, we also had another manatee that was tagged that uh, was utilizing uh, storm drains in the Cape Coral area, um, which was not a good thing. Um, but because she was doing that, we were able to determine that that was a problem and the city of Cape Coral committed to uh, a lot of money to fixing their storm drain issues because they had very large storm drain openings that animals could get into that were not um, and that should have been mitigated and they weren't. And so uh, again, little super spy tag manatee found it and we were able to, to get them to agree to, to work towards that. So um, just some 
I guess, extracurricular information we get from, from these tag animals that just go, go along to helping them. So I've always thought that was kind of cool. Very cool. We are pretty much at the end of our program. We're, we've got about five more minutes and I wanted to let you have a chance to um, share any closing comments that you might want to share with us. Um, you know, when you talk about wildlife, our environment, um, the earth, it, it can all sound very daunting and scary and bad and it can feel very overwhelming and nothing can be done. And I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that as much damage as the human species can cause, we are also very, very good at fixing it when we figure it out. When we learn that how to do it right, we're really good at putting it back together. Um, you know, the bald eagle is an example, the American alligator. So I, I always want people to understand this is not a hopeless situation. Nothing is hopeless. We just have to find the right way to balance um, our needs and wants with the world around us, which in, in essence is the same thing. Cause if we don't, we're still part of the world. We're not this separate entity. So it's in our, it's, it behooves us as a species to protect everything else because it just makes our life better. So that hope is there because we've done it before. I think we'll do it again. Again, it just takes understanding how to do it the right way. And there are so many brilliant people that are working on this around the world. And um, there are so many people like like all of you who care enough to sit through this and listen to me prattle on for an hour about manatees, that that is the hope right there. Because it, all it takes is one person who says, well, why is this this way? And then think, but why can't it be that way? And then we're off and running. And it's, and it's that one thing that will change the world. So I, I, I never want people to feel this is hopeless. It sounds bad and it is bad, but we can make it right. And we will. Um, and I, and then when I say we, I mean everybody together, the whole planet, because um, uh, we've come so far. We've done so much good. Um, we've turned things around. I said I was a Florida native. I've lived here where the Hillsborough River was not a place you would recreate because it was bad. Um, and it's 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 not. It's a much different river now. Um, my grandfather told me when I was 10 years old to um, appreciate a spoonbill that I saw in Ding Darling because it would be the last one I would ever see because he said they were going to be extinct and, and they're everywhere. So, I mean, it's those, those little moments of hope where you're like, okay, we can do this. They're there. So, so um, stay positive, look for those small changes that make big changes and, and we'll, we'll, we'll save the world one animal at a time. Well said, <laughs> thank you very much. That is a message that we, we can all live by. And Jim, thank you so much for sharing this time with us tonight. We are indeed fortunate as uh, a state, the state of Florida, as well as just the general population of people who love wildlife to have folks like you who are so passionate about what they do and knowledgeable and not giving up <laughs> and not giving up hope. So thank you so much. And, thank you for uh, having me. Oh. It was wonderful to, to be able to listen and to hear some of the questions that people are asking. Uh, there is so much that we need to know about these creatures, and I hope that the research that you are doing now will one day provide a lot of answers for us. I, I as well. And if anybody has further questions, um, Buddy can definitely knows how to get a hold of me. I'm happy to answer. I could talk about this all night. So. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm happy to answer any questions to facilitate anything that will take uh, what we want to do further. Feel free. Thank you very much. And if you want to send those questions to me, you can send, send them to Commander B, that's C-D-R-B-E-E -E at gmail.com. And I'll make sure those get to um, Jen. And... I'll go one further and I'll put that in the chat so you have it. And with that, I think we'll close this meeting. I just put, hmm.
cancers. Maybe Jen and I can talk about it on one of the days that we're out there floating around looking for manatees. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Great program. With that, we'll sign out. Bye.